Uh, thank you very much. It was an honor to be asked to come here today. And I should just say, it's not today and today only. I, I really enjoy hearing from people, particularly people who use our case book. So if you have pressing questions and or complaints, et cetera, you should email me uh, about them. My co-editor, some of you might know, Richard Epstein, uh, if, is, if anything, just uh, more uh, quick, speaks more quickly than I do, responds more quickly. So if you don't get a response within 24 hours, something might be awry. Uh, but let me turn to the uh, questions at hand about the book. The first um, thing to say is um, I'll be very short on just my overall praise for the book, given that I have just eight to ten uh, minutes. But it is a real feat, an accomplishment. Um, and one way to think about it is that this book covers a lot of the greats of the tort canon. So in it you will learn, uh, those of you who are studying torts, uh, will see Vosburgh against Putney, Kingston, Sindel, Paul's graph, Tarasov, you know, all the greats are noted and are infused with uh, psychological uh, findings. What's also unique about this book, though, some others might be able to do that and serve as a kind of compendium for the first year course, but they are on the cutting edge. So they actually have included cases that I've described as in emerging in the canon. Uh, there's a great case, Matthias, about bed bugs and punitive damages. You'll find that in here. They also are attuned to really cutting edge, difficult uh, emerging legal issues. For example, the use of historically um, uh, calculated uh, tables for work-life expectancy that have uh, uh, disproportionate impacts on uh, women um, and on various um, different races and ethnicities. So all of that is in this book. So it's a book not only for students, for law professors, but I think for individuals who are practicing in this area and who want to think about how they might incorporate psychological findings into these emerging areas. I'm going to focus my remarks on a particular chapter that I was intrigued by in the products liability chapter, thinking about warnings and the kinds of insights that they bring to bear uh, on this uh, subject. So the basic uh, theme is that psychological findings and research can really take into account of all of the steps that have to happen that run between manufacturers providing a warning and safe use of a product. Right? A lot of times in, uh, in your study of this, you might think about um, uh, liability for failure to warn. So uh, it's not as simple as just you have to slap something onto a product. There are these steps because we're dealing with humans. We're dealing with consumers of products who are actual individuals. They're not always the rational actors what Cass Sunstein has been going around calling the homo economicus, right, as opposed to real people. And so psychological findings can really help us understand this process. So two big questions that they address. Number one, why don't we read warnings, right? That's a really important one to think about because otherwise what's the use? So there are a lot of interesting reasons why we don't read warnings. Sometimes it's because they're in legal jargon, not in plain English that individuals who aren't from Cornell Law School would be able to understand. Many times it's because they're not salient and we're just not paying attention. Or we're actually very busy and we're paying attention to many things. We're just not paying attention to the particular information that's being conveyed in the warning. And there's a great experiment they talk about in their book called The Invisible Gorilla. And what happens, I don't want to ruin it, but I will. So this is a spoiler in a sense. There are, other, there are other experiments they tell you. You can go to the website and try it and see how you fare. But this one I'll spoil just to make the point. The Invisible Gorilla is uh, you ask individuals to go to this website and to watch very carefully. they are ordinary individuals wearing white and black and they're passing basketballs back and forth. And you're asked to watch how many times the white team passes the basketball. And there are two basketballs and it's being bounced and thrown and you're you know, devoting your attention to that task at hand. And afterwards they ask how many times was the ball passed and you feel really good about yourself because you get it right. 15 is the answer. And then they said, but did you see the gorilla? And you look at the experimenter and say, what do you mean, did I see the gorilla? And then they rewind the uh, video that you were watching. And it turns out while you were focusing on the basketball, someone dressed in a gorilla suit had entered in the middle, beat, the, beat his or her chest, and then proceeded on. And many individuals don't see that. Why? Because it's in the background. It's not made salient, uh, et cetera. So there are uh, various reasons why we don't read warnings. They go even further, though, and say even for people who read warnings, why don't people follow warnings? And what's 
going on with our lack of compliance uh, here? And they talk about various heuristics, right? Heuristics is sort of a big word that means rule of thumb, decision uh, simplification for individuals. They're actually very good. It's good we have heuristics or we would really be paralyzed in our daily life attending to most of the tasks that we're trying to do. But sometimes heuristics can lead us astray. So they talk, for example, about the availability heuristic when it comes to dealing with dangerous products. And that has to do with the idea that you're going to overestimate risks that are very present before you, that you have recently in mind. You're going to underestimate other uh, risks that are further afield, et cetera. Um, there's also a representative heuristic. You've used a product before, and you didn't get harmed by it, so it must be safe, because that must be representative of a whole class of products uh, and the like. And so for those reasons, you might fail to comply with warnings, because warnings are for other people, right? Therefore, as one judge put it at one point, when it's difficult to, to uh, come up with the right warnings, it's because you have to make warnings for the ignorant, right? Those people, not yourself, right, who has safely used products, et cetera. So examples in our own lives abound. Their book provides a plethora of great examples, experiments. I have to tell you just one from my experience here. So I arrived from Manhattan yesterday afternoon, and it was a great bus ride. You guys have this great system going back and forth to the city, but I'd been on the bus for four hours, so I wanted to walk around. So I spent about an hour and a half walking around. It's a beautiful campus here, and I was, it was great because it was a nice evening, not too cold, although I have to say it was 60 degrees in Manhattan. So even though I calculated where I was going, I was definitely underdressed. But I spent the time walking around in numerous places I encountered, because you have all these nice walkways and stairs, these signs that said, danger, no winter maintenance. So that's what it said, danger, no winter maintenance. And they were sort of on a top of a stairwell. So I just looked and proceeded and thought that was interesting. But I kept seeing that sign, danger, no winter maintenance. And then this morning, I went running. You guys also have this beautiful lake and gorgeous. So I was on a little path. And on my way to the path, there was a sign. It was a little different. Attention, exclamation point, no winter trail maintenance. But again, I proceeded and I went running. So why? I was susceptible to various biases here, right? I'm very over confident in my own abilities, right? These, these warnings might be for other people. But there are more serious problems with those kinds of warnings. And that's what their book really points to. What's the more serious problem with those kinds of warnings? Warnings have more than one purpose, right? Sometimes we think about the idea is to say, you know, attention, achtung, you know, watch it. Uh, and just there's risk or danger here. But there's another purpose of a warning, a good warning, which we'd be to suggest a safer alternative, to suggest to map out what it is you should do to comply, because otherwise, what's the problem? So what's the problem is someone like Professor Sharkey, who's overconfident, who might not be paying attention, even if I'm aware of all these biases, which I am in part because of not only this book, but a long infusion of my interest in psychology, which, by the way, goes back. I uh, had, to do, had to look back to this. Um, 1992 was my first class that was at all law-related, and it was called Psychology and Law. It was taught at Yale by Peter Sass. Alivet. It was my favorite class. I thought, you know, it was, I remember that class because it was taught in Battelle Chapel, which is a huge space. I learned just looking up, there were 1,052 of us in that class, so it didn't feel that big, but it was an amazing class. So I've been intrigued about psychological findings for some time. But the problem with warnings like this are actually, they seem to be more about disclaimers of liability, right? That sign there was sort of not telling me anything about what the real risk was, what this meant. It looked like other people were going up and down the stairs. That's another of the biases they talk about, the social influence. If you see other people ignoring warnings, you're going to be more apt to ignore those warnings, etc. And it also didn't give me any safer alternative. It didn't say, you know, don't use this stairway, go around uh, the other way. And that's part of uh, what their book, I think, brings uh, to life. So what I want to say in sort of closing, again, one thing the book does is it points to future research, and they've got their handle on some really interesting questions, a kind of um, one area that I'll highlight that they talk about where there's been very little research is assessing individuals' assessments of the cre uh, credibility of the manufacturer warning. So that's a little bit related to what I'm talking about here. If you think the manufacturer isn't really interested in telling you about safe ways to use the product, safer alternatives, but is really just trying to 
protect themselves from liability, then you're not going to be apt to buy into it and to change your behavior uh, in accordance with it. But I want to suggest in my last remaining few minutes something more ambitious. I want to suggest their next book, because of course, um, the thing I don't like when academics do is they say, here's the book you know, they should have written, and it goes on to be, you know, what Professor Sharkey is working on at the moment. No, this is really the book they should write, and it should be the sequel to this book, because this book had to have been written first. And here's my bad uh, title, they can change it, called <laughs> Humanizing Tort Liability. Now, why do I want this book to be written? There's some uh, appropriation I'm taking, actually, from a book that Cass Sunstein wrote a couple years ago that's called um, <clears throat> Valuing Life, Humanizing the Regulatory State. It's a great book. It turns out Cass Sunstein uh, was, whether you know it or not, the regulatory czar. Uh, more officially, he was the administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA, within OMB. So while he was in government, an exciting thing that he was actually able to do was to infuse actual regulation with behavioral law and economics and psychological findings and the like. And there are numerous examples. He had task force with academics who were doing this. The, the simplest example to give you is you may or may not have noticed that we have had uh, a uh, change in how the USDA puts forward food and nutritional information. It used to be a pyramid and it's now a plate. Well, what was wrong with the pyramid? A couple of things. This pyramid baffled people. It turned out consumers didn't know uh, regular individuals what to make of it. At the bottom of the pyramid, there were like big loaves of bread, and it looked like that would be great to be eating a lot of that and not fruit. Many people thought, oh, a pyramid? I want to go for the top. That means it's sort of most important. I can't miss these things. Those are the really dangerous foods that you didn't want to overeat. So now he's, they've switched it, the USDA, and this was actually one of the kind of regulatory reforms Forms based on a lot of the same psychological research. In fact, in Cass Sunstein's book, the gorilla experiment appears, right? You guys are your soulmates in terms of he's done this for the regulatory state and they could do this for the tort liability scheme. So um, the plate very helpfully actually divides because most of us eat on plates, not pyramids. So the plate shows us proportionally what should be on the plate, how much vegetables, how much uh, fruit, et cetera, much easier for individuals to understand and also maps what they are to do. Doesn't just say danger, you know, your, your health could go uh, down the tubes, right? It tells you exactly what to do. So in closing, I think this book about humanizing, the regu humanizing tort liability would be enormously influential. There are, I'll leave you with two cases that aren't in the book that I think their new book, their next book, could deal with. They're failure to warn cases. One's called Hood versus Ryobi. Those of you who have, you, know, you who use our case book will know uh, these cases. Hood versus Ryobi is a failure to warn case out of the Fourth Circuit, and Liriano versus Hobart is a failure to warn case out of the Second Circuit. So in very brief, both of them have to do with a dangerous product that was used without a safety guard. I'm not going to go into the gore. There's a lot of gore in both of these cases. But for our purposes today, the important thing is Judge Wilkinson writes an opinion in this Fourth Circuit Hood case. It's about a saw that's used without the safety device, and part of the blade spins off and bad things happen to the user. There were many warnings on that product. The user saw them, but he thought these warnings were about getting your clothes snapped in, etc. It wasn't that the thing would come off and hit me in the face uh, and in the hand and in the leg, etc. That opinion goes through and cites psychological research, including work by uh, Howard Latin, various of the studies that are cited in uh, this wonderful book as well, and says, you know what, there shouldn't be another warning here because there are problems of information overload. If you give too much information, you dilute really salient warnings, et cetera, et cetera. And the worry I have about only writing book one and not book two is many people will take many of these findings and will say, wow, I never realized how much we're saturated with information information, it can dilute things, etc. it means we shouldn't have liability. We should restrict liability. In the other case, Liriano versus Hobart was an individual who was working with a meat grinder. So they said, well, we're not going to get too much into the thick of the actual injuries uh, in this case. Suffice it to say, the guard had been removed uh, in that instance by the employer, not because the employer wanted, you know, fingers in the meat, but because it was more efficient to operate it that way. But in that case, it's a very interesting decision. There were, uh, there were not only warnings uh, that were in that case, but the danger was allegedly open and obvious. You can see the thing that's called the worm 
and it looks like something you don't want to get your fingers near when you're grinding meat. But in that case, written by Judge Calabresi, there's a fascinating part where he finds liability, and he says that there are two purposes of warnings. The first purpose is just to note that there's a danger here. But the second purpose is to provide safer alternatives, to let them know that there's something that you could do. And this is where, uh, I don't know where the authors would come down on it, but these kind of psychological findings can go in dramatically different ways with respect to tort liability. And I'd love to see them take this book and then uh, write about humanizing uh, tort liability. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to uh, Q&A later. Thank you. As the psychologist on this panel, I think one of the first things that I want to say about this book is related to what I see as one of the really valuable things about it, and that is legitimating psychology in the field of law. If you look back over the 20th century, you see occasional glimpses of psychology affecting law, some of them very idiosyncratic. At Yale, there was a period where everyone was very excited about Freud, so they wrote books about how the unconscious biases of judges affected their decisions. But in general, psychology has been kind of a boutique topic in law schools. Often law schools would hire a psychologist or a psychiatrist to teach mental health law, or maybe we would have someone teaching family law. But really, psychology is not considered to be part of serious law. And in, you know, conversely, empiricism wasn't really thought of as much related to serious law either. And there were occasional areas of empirical research in law that were empirical in the face of a big normative framework. Um, criminal law, my own area, I think has been more like that than other areas of law. <clears throat> but again, when you think about core areas of law like contracts and torts, it's really been an issue of doctrine and normative analysis. So this book is fantastic because what it does is it brings psychology into a core area of law and makes it central to any kind of discussion about torts. That really is important. It's essential if psychology is going to be seen as integral to law and law schools. So right away, I think what we see here is we see a whole new era of empirical framing of legal questions. We psychologists don't always like to thank economists, but I think we definitely should be thanking behavioral economics for paving the way with the general idea that empirical research was relevant to institutional design in all kinds of law. But as people like Kahneman have shown us, Psychology has a lot to contribute beyond that basic insight, and that's what I think we're seeing with this book. I agree with the many positive things that you've already heard about the book. I think the book is great because it's very readable. It's very complete. The authors have made a tremendous effort to identify a wide variety of very scattered literatures and bring them together into one place. I also think it's especially valuable because they've organized all this material in terms of traditional legal concepts. So like negligence, causation. As people in law, we think about those concepts and so the authors have done us the big favor of plugging the research into the categories that we're familiar with. Now I also think it's important to note that beyond this splendid book, both of the authors have been doing this for their whole career, and they've done a number of really excellent things besides this that have the same general goal. Professor Hans has a long history of writing about the jury. I've been using her books on the jury in my classes for decades, and they have the same features that I've talked about here. They bring a very complicated literature into a simple framework that's organized around the issues that are important to legal scholars. Uh, 
Jennifer has done this in the area of negotiation, and more recently, I'm very excited by her efforts to bring behavioral science into the area of professional responsibility and ethics for lawyers. So this is, in general, this is just a fantastic effort, and I think it's, in my view, reflective of what I hope will be a new era of law that embraces psychology wholeheartedly. One of the things that I also think is that there should be clearly a third book. And the third <laughs> book should be about two things that I feel like could be further developed. And the authors do us a big favor by mapping the terrain and talking about all the different areas that are important. But one of the things that I wish we could know more about is which things do they think really matter? Like, people are just a disaster from a cognitive point of view. They make all these mistakes. Well, are they all important to us, or do we think something in particular matters? And then, what do we think are the policy implications of some of these problems? How should they be resolved? And I'll just give two quick examples. One about causation, which I think is about cognition, and one about harm, which is something I think is about values. In the area of causation, we have a situation where the law and people agree. And I'll use the example of the fundamental attribution error, which I think is one of the most important examples that they give in their chapter. People don't see situations as causing behavior. They think bad actors or good actors cause behavior, and the law agrees with them. And so when we look at causation, we look at proximal causation and not distal causation. We look at the person and the intention and so on, causation and the person. And there's a big tradition against that in criminal law. The Hansen work, the Situationist blog, has talked a lot about the way in which this is really a misunderstanding of reality and one with profound consequences for the way we think about criminal behavior. I think there are similar implications here, that this is a situation where human cognition and the law don't conflict, but we ought to be pretty upset about that. And I think we ought to be asking ourselves, what are the implications of this for the way we think about institutional design? And the example that I would give is the big efforts that have been made lately to fix the alarmingly high rate of death in hospitals. Why is it that people get infections and die when they go to a hospital? Well, it's because partly nobody washes their hands, or they didn't used to. So we've got these bad actors who are running around not washing their hands. And they're negligent, we might say, and we should do something about it. But what has been done in the medical arena is much more ambitious. It's saying it's really the situation that's at the root of all this, so let's change the situation. And if you go to hospitals, you see on every wall there's a poster, did you wash your hands? I just went to the clinic and afterwards in the satisfaction survey they say, did the person wash their hands? In other words, let's create an institutional solution and then we won't have this problem anymore. So that's an example of how we want to ask which are the important problems and can we think of a way to solve them? A second example to me, it's different, is the justice or value gap. Here, the point is that the law and people don't agree. That is, the law wants harm to be about economic costs. It wants, let's give somebody money, and let's, so therefore we need to know, like, give me a doctor's bill or something like that. Yet we know that people really don't see it that way. They see a lot of harm as moral. And what they want is a moral solution. They want an apology, or they want to be able to stand here in court and say, you're an awful human being, and I want the whole community to know it. So the law and the public don't agree. And again, to me, that's a very interesting thing that comes out of a discussion about harm and remedy to harm. Whose remedy should the law really be concerned about? And here, I think the question we might ask is, can we think of ways that the law could be more responsive to what people want? And the, the authors of the book, Valerie and Jennifer, do talk about this, but I think it's a really bigger question. How can we design the institutions of law so that people feel like their concerns are being addressed? 
now that we know from the research what those concerns are and how they're different from the formal law. And now finally, I'll just say, to me, one of the more interesting questions that's very tantalizingly developed in their last chapter is, so what? That is, if you look at a criminal law analogy, you see Robinson and Darley, they say lots of times people's moral values don't correspond to the law. Why do we care? Because then people don't obey the law and that's bad for society. But where is the harm here? And in particular, can we think about a way to identify and conceive of the harms if, for example, tort remedies don't match people's hopes, goals, and expectations. That, again, is an effort to think about the so what, what are the consequences, as a way to guide us towards institutional design. When should we care? And then we might say we should change the law to fit people. If we don't care, we might say, well, lawyers are smarter than people. Let's just forget what the people feel, and let's just do what we think is good. Okay. So, Bottom line, I think this is a fantastic book. It's great on two levels. Now, instead of trying to struggle to teach these ideas in my psych and law class in, a, in an incoherent way, I have an actual coherent framework that I can use. And if you have been teaching the class as I have, you would realize how incoherent it has been before this book. So that's monumental. But it also pushes us to think forward now that we know these things and we have a coherent presentation of the empiricism, what are the action implications for the future? Thanks. I appreciate uh, Kathy and Tom's uh, remarks very leading figures in tort law and in psychology. Uh, my role as the final commentator, I'll try to provide uh, a little synthesizing and a summary of remarks before we turn it over to the authors. Uh, first, uh, but let me join in the compliments. Uh, th th this book is very clear, very easy to read, almost unbelievably free of jargon for a book that's trying to, in significant part, translate insights from one jargonly laden field of uh, <laughs> psychology into another uh, uh, law. And so how they uh, manage to avoid the jargon of either is, is really in itself an achievement. Uh, and as already said, they really synthesize a, a tremendous amount of material. And the book comes at a, uh, a good time, I think, legal uh, academics, law students are being, uh, have become accustomed in bits and pieces of some familiarity with heuristics, biases, foibles in cognition that the uh, psychologists have been hammering at us for uh, a, a, a little, little while. Um, just, just a minute. My pencil's sort of amazingly small, isn't it? How, how, how many inches is this pencil? Uh, how much longer am I going to drone on uh, before we get to hear the, uh, the answers? Not that long, right? Uh, I've, just attempt, I've just attempted to exploit you all with the anchoring effect in my little way. The anchoring effect, which is, I find one of the most fun. You just take a you're just primed with a random number, and usually it's, in most stories I've heard, a very big number. But perhaps it can be, uh, oh, you've got to be very clever. These, these, these psychologists often will say, up is very different than going down. Losses are very different than gains. Big is very different than little. But what I tried to do was say, whoa, very little. One, two inches. He can't be droning on for that long, or your estimate of how long he's going to drone on for will be smaller once having been anchored to a small number than if I had uh, said, how rich is Bill Gates? How long am I going to go on? Oh, I don't know. I mean, how many minutes do we have? Anyway, uh, where was I? Where was I? I was, I was uh, 
I, I, what I was trying to describe is, is in, in a way, it's almost the danger that we uh, non-psychologists, but you know, uh, attempting to be educated people and try to read the landscape. And some of these, like the gorilla experiment, like some of the others, are just so, uh, once you hear anything about them, you can't forget them. And it seems that uh, more or less anybody can employ these things in more or less any, any, uh, any situation. And so I think the, my first, point is the timing of this book. It's not at the beginning of the psychologist first having conversation with lawyers, but it's uh, a wonderful time for synthesis and taking a major area uh, like tort law and just systematically examining it uh, from the psychological uh, lens. So uh, clear, organized, jargon-free, uh, as I said, uh, I think it's great as a recipe sort of for the rest of us, greater use of psychological insights compared to lesser misuse of psychological uh, insights. So the, I predict that the use-misuse ratio of uh, psychological insights by uh, tort scholars and others uh, is sure to rise. Now, uh, the overarching uh, structural question, I think, in any law and book uh, is uh, how you structuring, how you structuring it. Uh, that's the structural question. Uh, and in particular, though, are you going to use the legal framework uh, or the psychological uh, framework? Um, and I, I think, as Kathy referred to, the authors here are definitely using the legal framework. And as you go through the book and just chapter headings and subheadings, they're extremely familiar to uh, a torts, uh, torts scholar, torts practitioner. I mean, intentional torts, negligence, duty, causation, uh, you know, both uh, but for cause, uh, proximate cause, uh, damages, including physical versus emotional harm, which uh, is just very familiar to the torts lawyer, uh, punitive damages, uh, chapter on products liability. Uh, these are the, uh, well, this is more or less how you've organized that, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the torts case book. Uh, and, 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 as, and as Kathy said, Within this discussion, of course, come out so many of the classic torts cases, and the authors apply the psychological approach, the psychological uh, insight, the psychological phenomenon to analyze these cases. So, you know, the Butterfield versus Forrester, the, I mean, the, from the, the torts scholar would say, oh, that's the introduction of contributory negligence, uh, really. Uh, old case, but no, 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 this is the story model of psychology, and now we'll have the conflicting story of the plaintiff and, uh, and defendant's approach. Byrne versus Bodle, uh, which uh, introduced res ipsa loquitur into the law is what the lawyer said. No, 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 this is a wonderful illustration of the base rate problem. Uh, the Kingston merger fires case, perhaps my personal favorite of, 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 of them all in, in, in the torts case book. Uh, and I've thought about that from various things, but no, this emphasizes and or nicely illustrates the issues involved in con counterfactual thinking, uh, which is another psychological uh, uh, phenomenon. Paul's graph, they apply causal chains. T.J. Hooper, the great case on custom, and lawyers can talk about custom and entire industry. Uh, maybe uh, lagging," said the great, uh, said the great learned hand. No, no, no. This is. Well, let, let's think about normality bias. I, you know, each of these, I think, might have to be said a touch of jargon, but just nicely <laughs> applied under what the heck this means as applied to T.J. Hooper. So my point being, they're using the legal categories as the structure, and then applying as relevant uh, the particular. Uh, psychological uh, insights. And in each area, they bring their uh, formidable and wide-ranging uh, knowledge of the psychological uh, literature, uh, you know, particularly the experimental uh, social psychology, uh, to the legal academic, the law student who wants to su 
uh, explore the psychological insights in a particular area. It's, it's just very easy to do reading this uh, book. And the endnotes are a true treasure trove uh, as well to those who want to uh, dig in a little further to a particular area. It could have been done the other way. It could have been done the other way. You could have said, this chapter is on heuristics, subchapter on each of the, uh, or many of the well-known heuristics. And then the next chapter could be on group decision making. And we could figure out all the various little ways or various little parts of the law that, that applies to. And the next chapter could be on base right neglect, or if that qualifies up to a full chapter, or maybe that's a part, part, part chapter. Uh, loss aversion, oh, that probably is a big one and has many uh, legal applications. And, and you could have just structured the book that way. Um, this has often been called sort of the hammer method when you bring a, a, a cognate discipline into the law. I have a hammer, let's call it psychology or psychological insights, and I'm going to wander around the law and just every time I see a nail or uh, I'm going to hit it. And, and of course, if this is the hammer, uh, pretty much everything's going to be called a nail. And uh, you, you get that way. Um, but actually, Jennifer and Valerie did do this way of looking at it. It's actually in their six-page appendix. Uh, so the book has the structure that's very comfortable to the uh, lawyers and the familiar legal categories applying the legal insights. So you just turn that matrix on its uh, on uh, 90 degrees, I guess. You rotate it 90 degrees. And then you start listing every uh, uh, psychological phenomenon that you know something about, they actually list 63, that they could have had 63 chapters in this book. They, they, start, they, they, nicely, uh, they nicely do it in alphabetical order so you have a chance to get it. Uh, so they range from actor-observer effect and effective forecasting. They go on through a bunch more mental accounting Overconfidence, kind of a big one that's already been uh, referred, re referred to. And finally, taboo trade-offs and wisdom of crowds. I guess there is no uh, Z psychological effect that we're aware of yet. It's <laughs> the wisdom of, 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 of crowds. And, it, and, and then in the appendix, they, you can just sort of read it off. OK, uh, you know. This phenomenon, which ones could it uh, apply to? And you can go look, uh, negligence chapter, burn versus Bodle, uh, and, and et cetera. Um, my last con concluding thought, or I, I guess the, uh, the next book that uh, I'll suggest, this is book, uh, uh, four, book four. <laughs> book four. Uh, they may have others of their own, the book five and six that, that, will, that will come. Uh, I think the, 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 inter the, the interesting thing that is, that is striking here is that um, in many, many cases they identify how the psychological frame fits nicely uh, and helps explain uh, an aspect of current tort doctrine. You know, tort doctrine is kind of getting it right. Uh, intuitively, somehow, it's just sort of getting it right. But of course, in other cases, no, 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 no. The, uh, the, the way the law is structured is missing or at odds or in conflict with uh, one of the psychological insights, what sort of Tom was referring to either. You know, the people sometimes want this, but the law sometimes is going uh, this way. And so the, the, the overall puzzle that I almost see it, you know, so, so, so sometimes the psychology is being used as uh, uh, in sort of a positive or analytic uh, descriptive explanation uh, or, or, or rationalization of the law. Other times it's used as a normative critique of how the law uh, perhaps should move. And of course the interesting question is uh, why when? You know, why is it that sometimes the law can match the psychological insights and the, and the psychological insights are used to just to, to uh, explain uh, the, the, the law and then other times how it seems to conflict. This is not, of course, unique to psychology. It's sort of the uh, major name of the game in any law and, uh, law and certainly uh, 
law and economics has the same exact thing. Sometimes we ha can do almost incredible just so stories on how this legal doctrine, that legal doctrine uh, it, it promotes efficiency. Uh, but at other times, uh, we kind of give up on that and say, no, it actually must diverge, and therefore the law is wrong and it should go towards uh, efficiency. And so the, the same thing. So in, the, in, in book six, uh, book five is which problems matter the most. And book six is, is sort of why do some, some psychological phenomena match the law and others diverge? I think that's actually a question outside of psychology, though. It, it, it's more on how, how, how law is formed and, and shaped. But thank you very much. And in despite the small length of my pencil uh, and going on, at least I'm uh, delighted to welcome our authors. Thank you. Well, thank you for those overly generous remarks. But we will take them. And I just want to begin by saying thanks to all of you for coming here to help me and Jennifer Robinault celebrate the publication of our book on the psychology of tort law. It's, it's a wonderful occasion. I always love the book panels, and it's a special pleasure to have written a book and to have a public event like this. What Jennifer and I are going to do, both of us would like to spend a couple of minutes about uh, talking to you about what inspired us to write this book. Uh, and then together we'll address the commentators' remarks and suggestions for many additional books that uh, they want us to be writing. And the inspiration for me actually goes back 30 years. Uh, in the fall of 1986, I was sitting in a Stanford Law School classroom uh, in a torts class taught by uh, 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 Robert Ellickson, uh, who was then at Stanford Law and since, I think, has moved to, uh, to Tom's, um, Tom's University. Uh, but um, he was beginning the torts class that I was uh, sitting in on with a fascinating discussion of our first, first torts case, which was Vosburg v. Putney. Now, as many of you know, that famous 19th century case featured two Wisconsin schoolboys, uh, one of whom kicked the other in the shin as the class was being called to order. And Vosburg, the one who had gotten kicked, uh, uh, actually had very strong reaction. His leg became inflamed at the uh, area of the kick. He wound up whimpering and had to go home, and there uh, ensued um, doctor's visits, medical bills, surgery, and actually eventually a permanent disability. Um, a kind-hearted Wisconsin jury found for him in a lawsuit against Putney uh, and uh, awarded him some damages, and the case was appealed. Well, uh, Ellickson then uh, began our discussion by talking a lot, of, uh, talking about a lot of the economic questions uh, involved in this. Um, suppose you have an injury that really nobody would have foreseen from a simple schoolboy kick, like the kind that Vosburgh did um, experience. Um, who's, what, what's the most efficient way of handling the costs of that injury? Uh, and what about uh, somebody who's especially vulnerable, an eggshell plaintiff like Vosburg? Um, should all of the expenses uh, fall on his poor little shoulders, or actually is it more efficient to spread um, the costs uh, in a broader direction? Uh, and uh, another question of special interest, I think, to psychologists, but also economic in nature, um, Putney was from a wealthy family. Uh, is it possible that the deep pockets of Putney and his family um, uh, stirred the juices of the jury as it debated and discussed uh, the damage award for poor Vosburg? Uh, those were fascinating questions, and I was immediately intrigued. But I was also intrigued at some of the questions that were psychological in nature and that were very, very key to the central tort issues in that case. Uh, so uh, those include what exactly do we mean when we say an action is intentional? Um, is it that you intend to engage in the act? Do you have to intend some of the consequences or all of the consequences? Should you be held responsible for all of the consequences if all you did was uh, intentionally kick uh, somebody else in the shin? And how does the context matter? 
I mean, these kinds of discussions, which we became engaged in in that law school classroom 30 some years ago, showed why Fosberg v. Putney was, uh, is often the very first case that many of the uh, torts casebooks open with. Uh, and um, it's the first case that many students wind up uh, reading uh, when they take torts. So I was really delighted to return to it when I taught torts here at Cornell Law School. And um, it, it is definitely in the psychology of tort law. It has a prominent, uh, prominent position there. But uh, the classroom discussion of that case, and, and really so many others that ensued over that semester, confirmed a key insight that eventually, over the decades uh, that have passed, led to our book and the motivation for our book. There were so many central psychological questions, yet in that classroom, we were forced to speculate. Um, although psychologists have actually done a lot of work on intentionality and uh, the concept of intentionality and what people intend, what they think about in the concept of intentionality, including the intentionality of children and how children understand that concept and understand intentionality of others, um, that work hadn't found its way into, certainly into the law school casebooks uh, and uh, into the area of intentional courts and torts and for that matter into uh, negligence and strict liability cases either. And even if there was relevant work in psychology, it wasn't linked to tort law issues and it was certainly in places that were inaccessible to the law student, the torts law professor, and also inaccessible to people who were charged with actually bringing tort actions or defending against tort actions in, uh, in the courtroom. And even though our field, the field of psychology and law, grew by leaps and bounds over this 30-year period, uh, it came to be centered on a smaller number of issues and topics, some you know, wonderful work in psychology and law, and really excluded others. And Jennifer and I really, as we were reflecting on it, saw uh, many, many areas within the field of tort law that hadn't had uh, this opportunity for linkage, hadn't had uh, anyone try to synthesize and pull together what we knew uh, about psychology and how it was relevant to tort law, uh, tort doctrine, um, tort practice. Uh, and um, that, in short, is the central purpose of our book, of this book, not the next ones, uh, but uh, to link what's known from psychology and allied fields, including economics, thank you, Stuart, uh, to the world of torts. So what our hope is, is by identifying what we know, um, that we're going to also be able to identify what some of the outstanding questions are that do deserve to be investigated by the next generation of scholarship on torts, uh, perhaps even some scholarship done by people uh, in this room. I want to say one other thing uh, that, uh, that has to do with where we are now, where we're standing. The fact that both Jen and I teach in law schools dramatically shaped the book. Uh, Stuart mentioned the way in which we organized our chapters around concepts, legal concepts, uh, so causation, intentional torts, uh, damages, defenses, and so on. Um, and, and I think actually, I don't think I could have written this book, or if I wrote it, it would have been extremely difficult, uh, sorry, different, um, if I had not uh, been in a law school and had not taught torts myself. I think one of the things that Jen and I, both having taught torts, and becoming familiar with the kind of cases, the broad range of cases with the issues, with some of the details and legal concepts, gave us a better chance to see some of the overlap and some of the divergence that our commentators have pointed to. So for this and really for so many other reasons, I'm, I'm so grateful to Cornell Law School for providing this hospitable and welcoming and encouraging environment. And I have to give a special shout out to the two deans uh, that um, were uh, my leaders uh, during the course of the book, Stuart, of course, and then also Eduardo, our current dean, uh, to also my colleagues who through lunchtime and many other moments shared their knowledge of law with me and to the empirical legal studies group of which Michael is a very significant and important part um, who 
uh, have, uh, who through constant discussion and debate, have improved my scholarship. And as well, I've got to note uh, the emergence here on the Cornell campus of the new Psychology, Law, and Human Development group. And we have some representatives from that, both faculty and students from that group. I think that uh, the opportunity to um, do work of a psychological nature within a law school, but in close proximity to people who are in their laboratories, apparently in their laboratories day and night, is really important to very, very high quality work. Um, and I give special thanks to my husband and my son, both of whom I'm delighted are here today, for many hours that they listened to me talk about Fosberg and Putney and Paul Scraff and more. So thank you. <laughs> Before I turn the podium over to Jennifer, I just wanted to make one final point about what we're hoping for our book. And, and I want to quote our late colleague, Ted Eisenberg, uh, who in 2006 had this warning for us. As those of you who knew him um, recognize, um, he was a great ambassador and creator of empirical research on law. And he warned in one of his articles written 10 years ago, that if systematic empirical research on the actual operation of the legal system isn't performed and the data preserved, and this is in his words, questionable analysis will be supplied to suit the policy agendas of special interest groups. I think there is probably no area of law to which his warning applies more than tort law. So in addition to whatever contributions our book might make to scholarship in law or in the field of psychology or the combined field, um, we hope that our account of the tort law system, which we describe in some detail in the book, uh, could serve as a partial corrective to the very distorted picture of runaway litigation, unscrupulous plaintiffs, incompetent, overly generous judges and juries. Uh, that's a picture that has been painted by special interests, and it has come to dominate the public discourse and is commonly understood to be the way the tort system functions. And I think what our research tries to do is say, no, actually there are many ways in which the operation of the tort system does not, uh, does not match that gloomy picture. Now I'll turn the podium over to my wonderful co-author. So I am grateful to be here. I'm grateful to all of you for coming. Um, this is a great event. Um, and I actually want to start with Ted's comments. Um, the thoughts reflected in Ted's words about the need for accurate information um, in the context of policy reform in particular, um, and in Valerie's description of the often distorted picture of tort litigation that continues to persist, um, those things have particular resonance for me when thinking about sort of the inspiration for me um, over decades to get to the point of this project. Um, so my first projects um, in the psychology of torts were done to try to develop a better understanding of tort decision making in the context of tort reform in particular um, and in the, in the reform of punitive damages um, specifically. So at the time, um, I was beginning a joint degree program in psychology and law. Um, there were a lot of discussions going on about tort reform. Um, and caps on punitive damages were a common and popular reform. Um, a few states had decided to take decision making about the amount of punitive damages away from juries and give it to judges um, because they would potentially be better decision makers. Um, but much of that reform was being done uh, with very, very limited empirical work on um, what the effects of those reforms uh, might be. Um, and also without a great deal of reform on the tort system um, itself. So in some of my early studies, um, uh, in one study I worked with Christina Studebaker to look at what um, some potential uh, effects of caps on damages might be, and we used the anchoring effect, um, to think about the possibility that caps on damages might cut off the very, very few really, really big awards that there are, um, but they might at the same time serve as anchors that might pull up 
the mass and mass of tort cases that are at much lower levels. And so they might potentially have this counterintuitive effect um, of actually pulling up most damage awards rather than limiting damage awards. Um, in other work, I started to compare the ways in which judges and juries made decisions about punitive damages in order to see what might happen if we were to think about switching that decision making over to judges and, and finding uh, many, many similarities among the ways that judges and juries thought about punitive damages. Uh, so at the time, I was interested in a whole range of questions about tort law uh, and tort policy, questions about the purposes and effects of various for reforms that were being proposed, um, questions about the purposes of punitive damages and how, it, how they were determined by fact finders, questions about whether and to what extent and how the purposes of tort law and the purposes of claimants, um, going to one of Tom's points, um, coincided and diverged. Um, questions about how people thought about negligence or causation. Um, but I found that at the time, much of the law and psychology scholarship was focused on issues that related either to mental health kinds of topics, um, to various facets of the criminal law, um, and sometimes to family law. Those were sort of the big areas that uh, people working in law and psychology were focused on. Um, and even those areas of law and psychology work that had application beyond the criminal law, um, work on juries, work on eyewitnesses, were mostly focused on application to the criminal side of things. Um, but there were, however, some important pockets of interest in the psychology of tort law. Um, importantly, Valerie's work on civil juries was getting underway at the time. And in fact, Valerie and I, I think, first met um, when she came to do a graduate seminar on her work in um, business on trial um, and litigation attitudes. Um, Michael Sachs' article on do we really know anything about the behavior of the tort system and why not came out at about that same time. Um, psychologists were starting to be more interested in damage awards in particular. Um, and other empirical work on the tort system was percolating as well. And in particular, I recall the, uh, the work that Ted Eisenberg and Kevin Claremont did um, comparing trial by judges and by juries, sort of around that same um, time. So it was this work on um, civil justice system that I found to be the most fascinating as a, as a graduate student. So fast forward to the past several, more than several years probably, that we've been working on this project. Um, as we tried to pull together these various strands of research and to, continue, and to think about the subsequent research that had been done, um, we tried in many ways to be somewhat comprehensive, to try to sort of work our way through the torts casebook um, and think about um, what aspects of tort law psychology had some insights um, to say. Um, so thinking about our coverage of tort law, and we also tried to be somewhat comprehensive in our um, review of psychology, trying to find uh, relevant psychological research. Um, but at the same time, um, figuring out very early on that there's so much more that can be done in this area. So one of our hopes is that in exploring the topics that we did, uh, we have provided some insight into all sorts of different kinds of questions about tort law. Um, we also hope that we have drawn attention to lots and lots of new questions for scholars to tackle, um, providing ideas for new research on the intersection of psychology and torts. Um, but I think we have really only scratched the surface here, so maybe that speaks to the fact that there are more books to be, to be written. Um, it, in just the past few weeks, I've had conversations with colleagues of mine at Illinois on other, um, on other topics that have raised questions about things that we could have included in this book but didn't. Right? So for example, um, one raised questions about the psychology underlying the concept of vicarious liability. Um, that's not something we covered here, but certainly something that has all sorts of um, psychological questions surrounding it. Another of my colleagues, I had a conversation with him um, about what a judgment of tort liability communicates to observers about the defendant and the defendant's conduct. Is it communicating a moral judgment about the defendant or simply a judgment that um, the cost-benefit analysis was done in a way um, that didn't meet the standard? 
right? Um, again, an, a question that could give rise to all sorts of interesting empirical research about those messages. Um, and those are only two um, questions among many that could be explored. Um, so I hope that this book um, in some way will help to d develop a more robust conversation around psychology and torts that goes well beyond uh, the things that we have raised here. Um, so like Valerie, I greatly appreciate the help and support of my colleagues and my students at Illinois and elsewhere, people who planted the seeds of this work, um, grappled with these questions along with me, offered much valuable feedback, and my colleagues at Illinois and many of you here um, offered all sorts of, of feedback to us that we found extremely valuable. Um, many of you on the panel and in the room did a lot of the research that we draw on, um, and we are extremely grateful for that as well. Um, my family, too, has spent lots of time talking about twin fires and Butterfield versus Forrester um, and being test subjects for the invisible gorilla. Um, we do all of that at our house. Um, I am grateful for all of those conversations. Um, and I, as a proud parent, am pleased to report that both of my teenage sons were among the first few people to read our book when it came out um, in January. So um, that warmed my heart. Um, so the last thing I want to do before we turn our attention to addressing some of the comments um, is simply to say what a joy it was to work on this with Valerie. Um, her thoughtfulness and creativity and critical eye that she brought to the project um, was invaluable and working with her was personally a pleasure. So um, I am grateful um, that we had the opportunity to do this together. Um, and as, 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 as um, I think Stuart was talking about the normality bias um, and our lack of jargon, I was remembering the drafts and drafts and drafts and drafts of the one sentence where we explain what um, uh, the normality bias is in, in the context of custom, where we <laughs> tried and tried and tried to figure out a way to say that in a way that, that made sense to people without any of the jargon. So um, those conversations were, were wonderful. Um, so our plan is that I will take a few minutes um, and respond to a few of the comments and then Valerie will do the same. So let me, let me say a couple of things. Um, first, uh, I think we are grateful for the ideas about all our, our next books um, and I think you have hit on exactly the sorts of things um, that ought to come next. Um, questions about where do we go about tort liability. Right, and under what circumstances um, and, and what effects do we think thinking about some of these psychological phenomena will mean for whether or not we find liability in particular circumstances. Um, questions about how do we think in really complex ways about the purposes of something like a warning. To what extent is it uh, needing to draw attention? To what extent is it trying to provide effective alternatives, to what extent is it trying to disclaim liability, um, and what do those things collectively mean about um, the steps that come between the warning and um, the compliance with the warning for the, the reading of the warning, for the understanding of the warning, um, and for the changing behavior in conjunction with the, the warning. Um, my favorite one, uh, going to the credibility point, my favorite warning is on a, a, a Batman costume for small children. Batman cape does not enable user to fly. <laughs> right? Um, and you wonder sort of what, what were the purposes of that. Um, and when we think about the need for warnings to be clear uh, but not congested, right? Um, how do we think about attorneys in practice advising clients about warnings um, in a way that pays attention to all of those different aspects of, of the warnings? Um, questions about um, the gap between what the law sees as the function of tort law, focusing primarily on economic costs, um, and people's need for a whole set of other things, I think, is also a really important question, um, both for scholars and for attorneys in practice. So um, we know that the tort system is sort of geared toward thinking about um, a judgment and an award of money damages. Um, Tom mentioned that people may have needs for apology. Um, they may have need for information. We know a lot of, of claimants 
bring suits um, in large part to get information when they are not able to get it in any other way. Um, they want reform, right? They want the, the, the infection rates in hospitals to go down and they want systematic changes um, as a result of their lawsuits. So thinking about um, whose remedy, in, in, in Tom's words, we should be thinking about um, and what changes in law we ought to be thinking about, I think are, are extremely important. I think thus far most of the discussion about these kinds of issues has focused on um, the negotiation side of things and the legal counseling side of things. How can we help practicing attorneys understand this whole array of things that their clients want and how can we um, use the negotiation and settlement process to accomplish those for our clients. Um, less thought has been given to um, whether there should be more structural reforms or legal reforms um, that might speak to those issues. Um, Tom also raised the question about um, the issues about sort of so what and what are the harms if we have situations where the law and what people want or what people think don't match up. Um, and this is something I think um, we came to, as we wrote the book, realizing that there were these places in which um, there were mismatches, right? Um, and thinking about them, um, at least initially, it struck us that sometimes there are places where the answer to the so what question is, it really doesn't matter, right? It, it seems perfectly okay um, for the law to uh, be operating in a way that is not consistent with way, the way people's intuitions are shaped. Um, sometimes it might be problematic um, that the law is trying to do something that is just so inconsistent with, with the way people think that, that the jurors, for example, aren't going to be able to sort of make themselves do what the law wants. Those, those are the places where the so what answer is probably more important. Um, and it may be that we need to think about what legal reforms might be appropriate to deal with um, the way people are actually making decisions. And then there's a, a, a version that's the, that's the flip, where um, we actually want the law to try to change the way the intuitions are playing out in the legal system. So our best example, I think, is in thinking about self-defense um, and what we know from psychology about racial effects on how threats are perceived, right? We may not want the law uh, to capitulate to the intuitions. We may want the law to think very carefully about how we can uh, structure things to override those psychological intuitions. Um, so I think there's a lot of work for us and, and others hopefully to do to think about whether and under what circumstances those differences matter um, and how they matter and what to do about them. Um, and I think that relates uh, a, a little bit to, to one of Stewart's points about um, why and when is the um, psychology important, right? Sometimes it's an explanation, sometimes it's a normative critique. Um, and I think you see all of that running through um, the book. Um, and I think Kathy's exactly right. We needed to write this book um, and bring this all together in order to give us a launching pad to start thinking about um, how, to, um, how to answer those so what and why and when questions. Um, I think the last thing I will say before I turn it over to Valerie um, is just to pick up on Stuart's anchoring point um, because I think it's an example of a fairly simple um, but profound phenomena um, that has all sorts of implications for how we practice as lawyers. Um, and Stuart's right, most of the time we're usually thinking about big anchors. Um, I, have a, I have some data that I recently collected from um, a big group of criminal defense attorneys um, and I asked them to um, tell me what the appropriate sentence would be for someone who had been charged with vehicular manslaughter because they were texting while they were driving um, and um, as these studies tend to go, half of them were just asked to tell me what an appropriate sentence is um, and the other half, I asked them first whether a sentence of 9,000 and something months would be appropriate, which translates into something like 750 years or something. Um, and all of them, of course, said, no, that's way too big. 
Um, and many of them said, are you sure there's not a typo here? And right, gave me a little bit of grief, which, which is good, right? They, they thought it was ridiculous, right? Um, the, the attorneys who were simply asked to give me a sentence gave me a sentence about two and a half years. The attorneys who got the 9,000 and some months gave me a sentence of about 12 years, right? That is, that's really, really important um, when we're thinking about how we are accomplishing justice in the system. If that sort of result translates into um, re the real world, right, um, then it suggests we might want to think very carefully about the institutional structures um, within which we are operating um, because um, we, that's, a, that's an intuition we don't want to let um, have play in the system. And I'll also just give you one last example where we have a small anchor, um, in part because it's a contrast and in part because um, one of your Cornell colleagues, Jeff Ruklinski, did this research. Um, he showed that criminal defense, or, I'm sorry, that, that judges um, awarding damages in civil cases um, awarded fewer dollars in damages if they were first asked to decide whether the case met the $75,000 jurisdictional minimum. Um, they all decided, yes, this was a higher stakes case, but that $75,000 minimum uh, pulled their damage awards down. Um, so an example both of the research that, that is being done here at Cornell that we found really useful for our purposes um, and an example of the way in which we re really need to think carefully about um, so what and what do we do, which it sounds like we have um, our work um, cut out for us over the next perhaps decades now. <laughs> um, so Valerie also okay. will make okay. some comments. Well, my comments are going to be brief in part because Jennifer did such a fantastic job of covering so many issues that are in our book and that respond to the commentators' very thoughtful uh, comments and, and critiques. And also because uh, Michael Heiss passed me a little piece of paper <laughs> saying, don't be long, uh, don't be long. Uh, so uh, I, I want to um, talk just about this broad issue that I think everyone raised because they've suggested additional books for us to write. The last chapter of our book, The Psychology of Tort Law, is a conclusion where we reflect on you know, what we've done and you know, point to some things we think should be researched in the future and you know, identify themes of the, of the book. Well, we definitely wrote that chapter last. That was the very last chapter we wrote. And, and you know, we read the rest of the book, identified some themes, and one of the themes was this convergence and divergence between psychology, psychological principles, and law. And as uh, the commentators and Jennifer have now outlined, in a, a you know, wide number of areas, we see convergence. We see law and psychology going on the same route, going on the same path. Uh, and uh, then there are the divergent areas, ones where psychology really fights the law. and. Uh, it, it wasn't until the final chapter that we actually realized that this was a theme going through our book. And I think, actually, we might have written a different book had we realized that that was a theme and, and we could have systematized that. So in addition to the books that they are suggesting, I think one of our next um, efforts should be to look at these areas of divergence and identify instances where we, we believe, um, like the examples Jennifer gave, uh, that uh, we should resist the psychological, the reliance on implicit bias, for example, in a variety of domains, um, and in which ones we should really look to law reform. I think those are some of the important things that uh, we might have done had we written that last chapter first. Uh, but uh, but um, I just want to thank you again for your incredibly thoughtful and generous comments.